I'm Mark Steiner, and welcome to the ninth annual Annapolis Summit, where we speak to the highest elected officials in our state to uh, talk about the issues that uh, are facing Maryland this coming year. Uh, before we begin, I want to thank our partners, the Baltimore Business Journal, for, uh, uh, for doing this with us once again and uh, helping this thing happen. And of course, the Historic Inns of Annapolis, where we're broadcasting from today. Uh, and Stevenson University and Dr. Kevin Manning, the Maryland State Education Association, the Maryland Department of Housing and Community Development, and CSX, who are sponsors of today's event, uh, and for WEA Radio, where we're broadcasting for Delmarva Public Radio, uh, and the Mayor's Cable Channel, who is here with us today to tape it and put it on the Air Force. So welcome, everybody, and let me welcome uh, our two guests here, uh, President for Life, Mike Miller, and Speaker Forever. Michael Bush, good to have you both with us. <laughs> and that's what Stanley Hoyer said to you the other day. Hose for eternity, Mark Snyder. <laughs> <laughs> so they'll be wheeling us down the aisle at some point in the next 20 years. We'll do this. Yeah. Okay, well, that's good. We'll all be here. So um, <laughs> uh, this is, every session's got its own personality because of the issues that you have to face, right? Right. And clearly, I think, uh, on the minds of everybody, uh, is the $1 billion deficit out of a $14 billion budget that we're facing and uh, the ways that we're going to have to wrestle with making that up. Um, we have uh, the Democrats on one side, uh, the Republicans, and some Democrats are saying cut. Others are saying, no, we have to raise some gasoline taxes. We have to find, we have to move money around inside, the, uh, inside our budgets. Transportation fund, again, may be being pulled upon. So tell, tell us from your perspective, uh, what do you think this agenda is going to mean? Mike? Well, I think uh, clearly we need a transportation uh, influx of money in the Transportation Trust Fund. You know, the Baltimore area is the most, uh, has the longest commute time of any area in, in uh, the United States. The Washington area is one of the most congested area of any area in the United States. Uh, we need transportation funds. That doesn't help our general fund, but it's help our Transportation Trust Fund. We've got bridges on the eastern shore that need repair. Uh, it's, it's a it's an economic development issue, it's a quality of life issue, it's a jobs issue. That doesn't help our general fund budget, but it's going to put, help people put back, back to work. I don't anticipate any other major tax increases. I mean, some will be proposed, uh, but uh, you know, there might be a flush tax increase to, to help renovate and reinvigorate our, our sewage treatment plants so we can help uh, with the, uh, save, stop the pollution of nitrogen and phosphates in the Chesapeake Bay. But uh, I think it'll be a year of, of cutting. Maryland is a very wealthy state, very wealthy state. We have one of the wealthiest states in the union. We have one of the lowest poverty rates. It's a great state to be in, but it's a state of middle and moderate temperament. I don't see any high taxes, and I don't see dramatic cuts. How do you see it, Michael Bush? Uh, let me just uh, address your question. I mean, everybody talks about uh, uh, budget deficit, but that takes into consideration what the natural growth of your budget is. Uh, you know, last year we finished with a $300 million surplus above the rainy day fund, which uh, we keep a rainy day fund of 5% of, uh, of what we spend uh, to uh, give us a AAA bond rating. So bet the best thing that happened the last year was that we didn't have to cut any interim at the Board of Public Works. So you, you have this surplus, 300, uh, $350 million uh, that you get to start with. Uh, last year we made some uh, very tough decisions on our structural deficit. Uh, we reduced the structural deficit in our budget by about 40% by uh, asking uh, state employees and teachers to pay more for the, the, their pensions to, to wait longer uh, before uh, they would be eligible for pension benefits. We asked uh, seniors uh, to pay more for their prescription drugs. They were tough decisions to make, but it reduced the structural deficit. Uh, when we meet as a group uh, before the session starts with the Spending Affordability Committee, we asked the governor to cut another $500 million, either find the revenues or make those cuts, and he will bring those down in the budget. But we made a lot of tough decisions with our budgetary process, but part of that structural deficit is also the growth of, of government. About $200 million will be the natural growth in Medicaid, and that's a, a fund that you have to match with the federal government, and that is a mandatory match. If you're going to increase uh, your commitment to K-12 through education to meet the Thornton goals, you have to raise uh, education another $200 million. That's just the natural growth uh, of the program. That's not an excessive uh, amount of money, that's the natural increase. But they're included in that uh, uh, deficit that is uh, projected. Uh, and when people talk about cutting things, I mean, everybody, everybody wants to talk about them, but no one wants to make them specifically. <laughs> uh, so the tough decisions are how do we get the 71 votes, balance our budget, continue to fund K through 12 education, higher education, and our health care system. And I think we do a wonderful job of it quick in. So uh, they're, they're clearly, 
we at least assume that the governor is going to propose a gasoline tax increase uh, over a course of several years is the right. assumption people are making. Um, and I wonder how you think that's going to fly in both your houses. Um, one of the things, I was at a, a dinner at gathering the night and the neighbors were going, one of the neighbors was going, just tell the governor we don't want a gas tax. Well, and other people were saying, well, we have to have a gas tax or we will, you know, we have to begin that if we're going to be able to keep things in place. What do you think is going to happen? It doesn't poll well. I mean, it doesn't poll well. I, you know, we, we, we need it. I mean, Jack Cade, uh, former minority leader of the Senate, was one of my key allies in the Senate. Great Republican leader. He knew we needed a gas tax. We would, he and I together would push Governor Glenn Denning to increase the gas tax then. Wouldn't do it. Didn't poll well. Uh, same thing with Governor Earl. Governor Earl would say, you know, there's going to be a war in the Middle East. Uh, who knows what case? Well, I, I can't do it. I won't do it. And in the first administration of Governor O'Malley, you can ask him about it. And we pushed him, and he just said, no, it's, we'll wait and see. But you wait and see is, is too long. I mean, we, we, we're, we're bold and innovative in Maryland. Honestly and truly, we've, we've raised the cigarette tax. I mean, you cross the, road, the bridge in my district to go to Virginia, and guess what? People save $16 <coughs> on a carton of cigarettes. They go across the Woodrow Wilson Bridge, the Morgantown Bridge, and they go over there, they buy 10 cartons of cigarettes and save $160. Then they go to Costco, they go to Best Buy, they go to Walmart, they get their gas, they do the shopping. People have to understand, just like nations have tariff wars, counties and states have the same problem. We've, we've raised the alcohol tax last year. I, I moved it out of the Senate. It's the first time a tax on alcohol has been raised since 1955. The, the, the last time the beer tax was raised was 1972. We use it, we put money for, for, for children and special needs, and also we put some money in for school construction, which help put people back to work and help the counties. And so it's a, we're making great progress. State. Just a few years ago, we raised the sales tax, put half of the 1% into the Transportation Trust Fund. Now we're gradually moving that out to help with the general fund budget. Uh, again, I think this governor's done a good job in terms of managing the budget. We balance the budget every year. There's no gridlock. You know, we, we deal well with the minority party, and it's a, it's a very pleasant place to work in. Let me just uh, say this about the gas tax, if I can. I mean, nothing happens in the vacuum down here. Uh, for the gas tax to be successful, I mean, the governor is in communications with uh, the county executives from the major subdivisions like Leggett from Montgomery, Usher and Baker from Prince George's, Ken Ullman from Howard, uh, Stephanie Rollings Blake from Baltimore City. Uh, if, if they uh, get with their delegations and identify projects that they need and they believe uh, uh, should take place, and those delegations support that, then the gas tax will go forward. I mean, uh, I think uh, there has to be some kind of groundswell in those uh, metropolitan subdivisions that the President of the Senate talked about, uh, where the congestion takes place in the Washington, D.C. suburbs and the Baltimore area. Um, the debate between the, uh, some of the rural areas and, and is whether the money is used for mass transit or whether it's used for uh, road construction. That's uh, where a lot of that takes place. But at the same token, uh, the President of the Senate talked about uh, jobs which is the major concern that we all have. Uh, right now, uh, you have the lowest interest rate we're going to get. Uh, Bernanke has claimed it will be 35 to 4% for the next two years. Labor costs are as low as they're going to be. Roads, schools, bridges, uh, libraries, they all provide a community benefit. I mean, the governor yesterday announced that uh, he's going to put $376 million into school construction. That leverages another $500 million from uh, local governments to, in school construction, about $800 million, almost $900 million. That creates about 12,000 jobs in the construction trades. And for those who want to talk about the job creators, these are all private sector jobs in the construction trades. And they provide a community benefit that people can see. So where does the money come from, though? I mean, how do, I mean we, if we raise the gas tax, let's say, um, the, what we, all we seem to do is raid the Transportation Trust Fund transportation fund to pay for what we can't pay for, rather than saying we're going to raise taxes uh, on anything else. So if we raise the gasoline tax, does that go into the general fund? Does that go to the transportation fund just to be pulled out later by somebody else to pay for something we can't afford? How's it going to work? It goes to the transportation trust fund. And this, this myth about the governor's rating it willy-nilly just doesn't happen. I mean, Governor Ehrlich, Governor O'Malley, I mean, occasionally, but they, it gets paid back. And the, the fact that it's a raid the transportation trust fund, when we cut back the counties, we cut the county's share of the transportation of, of the gas tax funds. I mean, that was just a, a, it was a cut. Uh, but we don't raid the transportation trust fund. But, but if we do pass the gas tax, and it, the speaker's job is going to be much more difficult than mine, uh, because, I mean, these are new members. 
Uh, they, they, they really aren't sure of themselves. Some of them have only been in office for a year. They don't like their first real tough vote to be to vote for a major tax increase that doesn't poll well at all. So it's going to have to be an administration bill. The governor's going to have to sponsor it. The Secretary of Transportation, Beverly Swain Staley, is going to have to lobby each member vote by vote. Uh, you want the, the Dover Bridge passed, it's a $50 million bridge. You raise one cent on a gas tax, it only raises $30 million, one cent a gallon. You raise five cents a gallon, it's going to be $150 million. The, the Republicans want a bridge in my area from St. Mary's to Calvary. That bridge costs $750 million and not one of them will vote for it. You know, That's the kind of uh, problems we have in government. Uh, do we put money in rapid transit? Do we put money in rural areas? Do we put one in urban areas? Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough, a tough job, but it's, again, the Speaker's job is, is much more tougher than mine and needs to be a governor's bill and he's got to work hard to make it pass. Hey, let me just uh, comment a little bit on the Transportation Trust Fund. I mean, uh, what we've taken out is what's known as the highway user money, which goes directly back to uh, county governments. We had to make a decision whether we were going to fully fund the K-12 education system or fund uh, the uh, 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 local government's uh, uh, transportation. You know, we are in the middle of a recession, and you had to make priorities, and we've always priorities education number one. I mean, uh, we're like every other state, uh, balancing their budget and trying to prioritize those things. Uh, we have not let any federal money sit on the table uh, for transportation, and as the President of the Senate uh, talked about the bridge on the, the Eastern Shore, about 80% uh, of that money will come from the federal government if we make a match. Uh, think of the number of jobs that we can build that bridge on the eastern shore that you bring to the state of Maryland if you can leverage 80% of the money from the federal government uh, on that uh, uh, project. So let's, let's talk a bit about, we talked about education and construction, school construction, which the governor proposed, and I guess we'll propose it officially, and his state of the state address. Um, education funding last year was, by some means, flat funded. I mean, you fought at the end, got $70 million more, but it was flat funded. If you go by the Thornton formula, we're talking about $148 million more that has to be put in education to keep that going. Right. Um, and if you couple that with, I don't want to mix apples and oranges here, but um, we'll get the maintenance of effort in a minute. Um, uh, but so, so is that going to happen? Are you going to be able to pull that money out for education? Is it going to stay flat? Are we going to raise more, put more money in because of inflation? I mean, we talk about education being the most important thing, our kids right. being the most important thing. No, I mean, I mean, when you talk about the deficit, uh, uh, part of that is the increase in uh, structural deficit is the increase in education this year. That will be part of the budget. We will increase uh, our commitment to K-12 education. I'm how sure much, the how much do you think it will be increased? Will it get to the Thornton level or will, will it not get to the Thornton level? I think it will get to the Thornton level in the governor's budget. Uh, so, I mean, you know, it's a natural increase that you'll see there. It, it's not anything excessive. But it's a natural increase in the budget. Look, look everything in Maryland, uh, our tax structure and everything else, basically centers around the education system. We have 24 subdivisions. We have some of the largest school boards in the country. They are not allowed to raise taxes. So they have no fiscal uh, responsibility. The state puts in a tremendous amount of money. We put in 48% of the total education budget in the state of Maryland, 46 collectively from the counties. What we ask the counties to do is to meet a maintenance effort. In other words, they have to maintain the same level of funding uh, appropriate to the state to keep that education system uh, uh, going in the right direction. Uh, what we're having a problem with is a lot of the counties now are not being able to meet maintenance effort, and that's what we have to deal with because so how, school how, boards can't raise money. So how do you deal with the maintenance effort issue? It was $243 million shortfall last year from several counties. Didn't come up with the funds that were supposed to come up with the schools. Could be worse this year. Uh, is... Um, are there going to be laws passed that make sure that doesn't happen? I mean, what can the state legislature do to deal with that issue? What we can do is, I criticized the governor last night, justifiably so, for, for, for coming out and announcing $375 million in school construction. I mean, it's the right thing to do at the wrong time. Uh, you know, Governor Ehrlich in four years put together $600 million in school construction, four years. You know, we put more money in school construction that in the last two years than, than Governor Ehrlich did for four years. Uh, we're one of only five states that, con that contributes to school construction for the county. We're the only state in the union that gives our county uh, our income tax. You know, we get $7 million from the, the income tax. The counties get four, $4 billion in income tax. We're being very good to the counties. But what the governor needs to do is package this. And I explained this to him, and he understood uh, what I was saying, and he recognized that what I was saying was right. He needs to package maintenance of effort. He needs to package school construction, and he needs to package... Um, 
a change in the uh, pension plan. Uh, the fact that the counties continue to, to set salaries and we have to pick up the cost of pension is, 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 is ridiculous. It's, it's, it's got to change. It's a billion dollar cost to the state with no funding source whatsoever. It's gone up 35% in the last five years. It's more than we, here's Stevenson, we, we have a debt for higher education, for a pension for more than we spend for all of higher education. We had nothing to do with setting that cost. It has to be addressed, it needs to be changed, but it needs to be packaged so that the county see a huge benefit. School construction, maintenance of effort, and also a shift in the pension formula. Mike, I mean, how do you, how do you, how's it gonna fly in the house? I think, look, I think the maintenance effort, uh, aside from the school construction, is, is a very important <laughs> issue this year. What we found is counties, and I'll use, there was one on the Eastern Shore that has a revenue cap, and you run into counties that have revenue caps. They reduced their, their contribution to K through 12 education uh, in Wicomico County by about 30 percent. Right. So, I mean, they're not meeting their maintenance effort, and unfortunately, uh, school children in Eastern Shore uh, are going to be the ones that uh, are going to have the, the issue. It might not be immediate, but it's going to, it's going to come down the road. Uh, so I do think uh, you have to make sure that there's this uh, continued input of funding uh, from local governments that meets the, the uh, investment that the state has made. Like I say, we put 48% total money into uh, K-12 through education. That's pretty astronomical when you think Pennsylvania puts about 34%. I think Virginia's in the, in the 30 range. Uh, it is a tremendous investment. But at the same time, we've been ranked number one in education for three years in a row. In the last 20 years, Maryland's has made an effort to be an uh, education-based economy. Uh, we pride ourselves on our K through 12 education system, our higher education system, and the fact that our, our uh, uh, workforce is one of the best educated in the country. 44% of Marylanders of age have a college diploma. Uh, by 2025, we want to make that 55%. Uh, and the statistics shows on USA Today that uh, in this recessionary economy, if you have a four year degree, your unemployment rates is uh, 5% or less, uh, if you have a high school diploma, it's 10% or less, and if you have neither, it's 15%. So I think uh, the benefits that we see in the state of Maryland from a well-educated workforce, we also have the highest median income of any state in the union, have benefited for our, our investment there, and we can't let counties not make the same well, investment the state me, makes. Let me ask a question before we, before we move on to some stickier subjects. It's uh, in sticky? No, this is sticky yeah, enough, okay. but some stickier subjects uh, around uh, the environment, some controversial issues will come up. Uh, in this session. Um, but what are counties supposed to do, like Wicomico County, that are poor counties? They don't have money. Uh, where, where, where are they supposed to get the money? Well, that's a great question, and I, I want to answer that. Because the way the system is set up is the state money that comes into the state coffers, whether it's the income tax, the sales tax, the corporate tax, or the lottery, according to the wealth of that county, they get more money back. So the contribution that uh, Montgomery, a very wealthy county, gets uh, they probably get 30 cents back on the dollar from the state. Somerset gets 80 cents back on the dollar. We're asking them to make a 20% contribution. I mean, Allegheny County, we paid 100% for a school in Allegheny County because they didn't have the money. Because we believe every child, no matter where they come from, a poor subdivision or wealthy subdivision, should get a great education. That's what we commit ourselves to. But, the, but on the opposite side, the wealth of Montgomery County, they have the piggyback tax. So those wealthier people they'll get a billion dollars from their piggyback tax. Big, big and one. How, Howard County will get a lot of money. They get less money back from the state because they're the wealthiest county uh, in the state. But counties, there is no excuse for counties under the system that we have not to make the appropriate contribution to their K through 12 well, well, One last thought on this. But it's, it's, they have the tax capacity. Of the, you know, they, uh, so many of them are now dominated by so-called Tea Party candidates, and they choose not to do this. They just cut, cut, cut. And they ignore the, the requirement of the Constitution just to fund education. That's, that's, that's the one thing we have to do. And just like the Tea Party says many, many places, you know, to hell with the Constitution. We're just going to do what we think is best for our, 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 ourselves. So, again, we're also talking about counties are being asked to shoulder more of the burden of pension funds. Right? Well, what what so, you're asking is some kind of shared liability, is what the President of the Senate is asking. You have to remember when uh, you know, the State Board of Education preceded any uh, charter county government uh, and uh, you know, the state school boards 
It was a state entity, and it still is a state entity. But the question is, should there be some kind of shared liability in the pension system? And the President said it's right. We, we assume about a uh, billion dollars. But if you do that, the county's got to be able to have uh, some kind of uh, uh, resource to do it. When we shifted Social Security to the counties, we gave them the right to, to raise the piggyback tax. That was done in 1992. So there has to be uh, some kind of uh, uh, relationship that is worked out uh, for that to be in, done in an equitable situation with the counties. It's no doubt about that. If they're going to raise salaries, they got to understand the true cost uh, of salaries, and that they can't be they can't shift the cost to us to to pick up the cost for the the pension uh, benefits when we have no funding source for it whatsoever. So let me talk about some of the issues that, that, that we're going to face in this okay. session. I think some people are calling for a tax on cigars that will equal what we do with cigarettes. And studies showing that children, half the kids who smoke, young people who smoke, are smoking cigars or the flavored cigars than the, as it were cigarettes. And so the question is, do we push that, A, to raise more revenue, but B, cut back on the smoking and help our children, some people would argue, by raising the tax on cigars and raising the tax on these flavored cigarettes? Look, I think clarification there, I, I think they're asking uh, on the cigars, a lot of kids are, are smoking the flavored cigars. I don't think they're talking about premium cigars. Uh, uh, quite candidly, and uh, I think that's going to be something that's going to debate it uh, whether it be treated like uh, cigarettes or not, and it'll be in front of the Ways and Means Committee. What do you think in your house? I don't think it's, I don't think it's going to pass. I mean, I'd say, uh, you know, it's the, the people that are advocating the tax, you know, want to tax these out of existence. The power to tax is the power to destroy. Uh, and it's a question of is it tax power? Is it tax policy? Is it legitimate tax policy, or is it to, to eliminate something that they don't like? Uh, and that's our job to balance that out. I think it's to eliminate something they don't like, and uh, rather than, than sound tax policy, it raises a minuscule amount of money, and I don't think the juice is worth the squeeze. I mean, to, to put, let's just say if you, if you narrow that down to just the flavored cigars, cigarettes, that are so, that, are, that, that they're pushing on our kids in every corner store in Maryland. Not every corner store, but you know, right. all the state. Well, that, that's part of the question. Should they be considered cigarettes? Uh, rather than cigars, in, in essence, and whether that's viable to tax them the same as cigarettes are, because young kids are going to use uh, those type of cigars. They they sell them. In, they're sold in a pack of five. I think they sell them individually. Right. And uh, there's a lot of advocates, particularly from the urban areas, that want to do away with that. So we'll have a hearing on it, see where it goes. But it isn't a lot of money as the president said. Last time I heard, you had, don't you have to be 21 to buy cigarettes? 18, I, I think. Eight, yeah, I, don't, right. I, I don't know. Of course, you have to be 21, but I mean, you know, you can always get somebody, go me, buy this pack for me, right. buy this for me. Get I mean, me, I, I voted you. to lower the drinking age to 18, and five years I voted to raise it back to 21. You know what I mean? <laughs> just, uh, uh, it's a Vietnam era, and then finally we found out the 18 years were buying the alcohol for the 15 years old rather than 21 buying for the 18, you know? <laughs> Let me, now, there is some talk that, um, that, that, uh, there could be um, a, a, an attachment on a bill um, that would limit the University of Maryland law school clinics from uh, and cutting back on their money so they can't go after the issues that, that, that blew up around uh, their taking the case to Purdue and the Hudson family. Now, is that what's going to happen on the floor with that? Is that going to is that going to be an issue? Is that going to is that going to be a push from either one of your offices to limit the, the ability of University of Maryland law clinics to do that work? Look, I, I think you know one of the issues there, and it's kind of a gray area, is that I think it was set up uh, for the law clinic to go after some major corporations to protect individuals. Uh, in this case, they went over after a mom and pop uh, farmer didn't have the ability really to defend itself. I think that's a little bit of a gray area there. But I think uh, they certainly they certainly uh, provide a, a a very valuable asset to the state. It's a question of what their scope should be in, in, uh, in uh, going out and advocating for uh, certain issues. Well, see, I mean, the underlying issue there in this case, as I understand it, um, and we just spent uh, days uh, we'll hearing on the Marble Public Radio and EAA soon, our conversations with, the, with Purdue, we spent two days there and going back to spend more time with them, um, is that the law school was one of the things the students trying to do is say, whose responsibility is it when there's runoff? Does it belong to just the farmer? Or is it belong to companies like Purdue and Tyson who contract with the farmers? So in that sense, people have argued that, that going after Hudson was a mistake, but the larger part of the case was had to do with uh, is, is, is are companies like Purdue liable for that? 
Well, who's paying, who's paying, who's paying for the legal fees for that uh, mom and pop farm? The producer raised a lot of money for that, and they've raised, they've raised what, a couple hundred thousand dollars through their Save the Family Farm website. Did they? Yeah. The other issue, though, was the basis of the lawsuit was not chicken manure. It was the sludge from Ocean City, the municipality that had put it on the farm. We have some inconsistencies in our law. For example, uh, the big counties, Montgomery County, Prince George County, Baltimore City, Baltimore County, can spread sludge in frozen ground in rural areas uh, all winter long, but farmers can't put fertilizer on where they're going to expect to grow crops in the winter time. Uh, so these are just some inconsistencies that come up. I think the University of Maryland Law School does a good job. I think cases need to be monitored more closely, understand the ramifications. But we don't, we don't want to certainly curb, uh, uh, find a way to, to, to curb their activities. But they, they do need more close scrutiny in terms of the cases that they, they uh, undertake. Yeah, I, I agree with the President of the Senate. I think it, it's a valuable, valuable asset that the University of Maryland Law Clinic. I, I just think you, you need to have, uh, at least the legislature needs to have some understanding of what the scope of uh, their practice is in, in that regard. I mean, but was there anything in the case, and we'll move on to something else, that, 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 didn't, that you don't see where there was no merit in this case? I mean, even the court saw that there was no merit when Purdue tried to pull themselves out of the case. Look, I, I'm not a lawyer. It's, it's hard for me know, to say coach. that, but I, but I, uh, <laughs> but I, I felt uh, fairly strongly. I felt uh, an empathy for the family that was put in the middle of this. I mean, if if uh, the law school wants to sue Purdue or they want to sue Exxon or they want to sue someone of that nature, that that's fine. Uh, they have the ability to defend themselves. But the fact of the matter is, I, I think uh, this mom and pop farmer, and and it had to be a, a numbing effect on any other. A mom and pop farm down there of you know what what they were going to do in case that uh, took place with them I mean there was runoff there was runoff and, and since there was runoff there's a case uh, the question is whether the resources are directed at the family farm or are they directed at uh, at Purdue uh, and, and their goal is laudable the goal is preservation and protection of the Chesapeake Bay and no one can certainly fought their their, their laudable goals well, we're here in Annapolis in the ninth annual Annapolis Summit at the historic Inns of Annapolis uh, with our partners of Baltimore Business Journal. Uh, Stevenson University has been with us since the beginning. We're here, here with uh, the Senate President, Mike Miller, Speaker of the House, Michael Bush. We'll take a short break and come back. Welcome back. <laughs> that was a very short break, and here we are uh, at our ninth <laughs> annual Annapolis Summit uh, with uh, our two guests here for the first hour. Uh, Senate President Mike Miller and, uh, of course, Speaker of the House Michael Bush. And, folks, we want to encourage you to uh, leap up and get to the mics. Don't hurt yourself. Remember, going around the sides. So you don't walk in front of the camera at the center aisle. Uh, and uh, we let you get your questions and thoughts in here. And as we do every year, our partners on the Eastern Shore, the Marvel Public Radio, uh, is up at the mic first. Yeah, Don Rush from uh, Del Marvel Public Radio. I was curious about what your reaction is to plan... Maryland, there's been a, a certain pushback, certainly from local officials, about the idea that it doesn't give local governments uh, as much say as they would like in terms of planning, in terms of development. What's your own assessment of what the governor has done with his executive order, and how do you reassure local folks, particularly in the rural areas, particularly in the Eastern Shore, uh, that they're going to have adequate input into how development is planned in terms of plan uh, Maryland? Well, we've had public hearings on the Senate side, and we anticipate more public hearings as we go forward. Uh, I would anticipate changes. Uh, you know, uh, uh, obviously, you know, one of my favorite senators, uh, Republican leader from Cecil County, I believe Cecil's still part of the Eastern Shore, the, the northernmost county in the Eastern Shore, uh, says it's part of the governor's war on, on uh, rural Maryland. And, of course, it's not true. It's just that uh, the ur urban areas have developed. The governor's trying to protect... Uh, uh, the most ecologically sensitive state in the Union. We have more miles of waterfront in this small state than any state in the Union, more miles than Florida, California, Texas. And uh, we're trying to preserve and protect that, but at the same time, uh, work with the counties, work with the county commissioners to make certain that their development and, and plans you know, are responsible. Uh, if you look at what happened in Frederick County, where the Frederick County immediately took new commissioners, took office, then they immediately uh, down-zoned everything. I mean, they changed the zoning everywhere so that uh, it opened up development all across uh, a very sensitive area of Frederick County. Uh, things like that need to be avoided and there needs to be oversight to make certain that uh, uh, an abridgment uh, of our, our, our environmental 
uh, protection laws that are in place uh, that, that don't happen. Yeah, I think that's going to be a starting point. Uh, the governor's plan has been put in by executive order. I think there'll be numerous public hearings, and I think there'll be legislation, in, and it uh, will have probably some fine-tuning that takes place in the Environmental Matters Committee under uh, Chairman McIntosh. And identify yourself and uh, ask a question, please. Tyler Smith, Baltimore City. I'm curious about your position on a bill that would ban the use of arsenic in Maryland poultry production. Uh, you may know that arsenic has been routinely fed to chickens in Maryland to make uh, them grow faster and to make their meat look more appealing to consumers. Uh, 110,000 pounds of arsenic is included in chicken manure that's applied to farmland in this state. and Much of that runs off into the Chesapeake Bay where it can pollute waters. Uh, given that, do you two support the bill that several legislators have proposed now for several years that would ban the use of arsenical drugs in poultry production? I personally am going to depend upon science. If what you say is true and if it is a major factor in causing illnesses or death or is harmful in any way to the population, then I would agree with you. But I'm going to wait to hear the public hearing and the expert testimony. Yeah, I, I think that's uh, the appropriate way for <coughs> any legislative body to go. I mean, obviously, we want to do everything we can to protect our citizens and the products that, that are eaten. You obviously, you have the FDA that also plays a role in this. But, uh, you know, if, if there's an alternative uh, other than uh, the arsenic, I'm <coughs> certain that uh, we will take uh, every opportunity to look at that. We certainly don't want to do anything to harm anyone. So do you think it will actually, will it get a hearing this year? I mean, the, 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 uh, I mean, in 2007, Purdue stopped using arsenic. Right. Um, Tyson and some other companies remain, keep using it. Some of the science does look like it stays in the soil. Uh, I don't know about the human element right. of it in our water. So, um, uh, and according to the folks at Purdue, it hasn't affected their chicken raising at all. So right. why not just ban it? I, look, I, I, I'm, I, I'll wait to find out what the, what the hearing is. I'm not an expert in this, this field quite candidly, but I think uh, you have to have the testimony on both sides. Tyson is based in Arkansas, to the best of my knowledge, and Purdue is based here. Uh, the FDA oversees uh, much of this uh, on the federal government level, and if it's going to be beneficial to the citizens of Maryland, then we might very well ban it. Yeah. Hi, good morning. My name is Jen Brock Cancellieri, and I'm with the Maryland League of Conservation Voters. I want to first thank both of you for your years of leadership um, in cleaning up the Chesapeake Bay. Science has shown us that it is improving, uh, which we're thankful for, but we need some additional job creating tools. And my question for you is if you're both uh, committed to passing legislation this session that would establish more um, job creating tools to clean up our local waters and the Chesapeake Bay. In fact, as you know, I'm getting an award this year. <laughs> well, I mean, for creating the Chesapeake Conservation Corps, you know, I mean, uh, it's like the Civil Conservation Corps that uh, Franklin Donald Roosevelt put in effect, and, uh, you know, it's, uh, it wasn't my idea, it was my staff's idea, and it made a whole lot of sense to me, and we were able to get it through, and we have these uh, young interns and volunteers, they go to work, and they, 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 we find people to sponsor them, and they work for these wonderful environmental saving causes, and, uh, and then it leads to jobs for them in, in the, the green area, in the environmental protection area. And so it's a, it's a fabulous program, creating jobs in the environmental area. And we thank you and your organizations for helping sponsor them. Um, but we can do better, and we certainly will. I think in the area of the Chesapeake Bay uh, Restoration Fund, uh, which was really instituted in the, with the previous governor, it's been a very successful program. Unfortunately, uh, when we estimated the funds back then, uh, wasn't enough to build all the uh, water and sewage treatment plants that we needed. Uh, so there'll be a serious discussion on that about uh, increasing uh, the fee that's paid, uh, which is commonly known, I guess, as the flush tax. But uh, that is also a job creator as, as well. So, I mean, I think that uh, it's been very beneficial from an environmental standpoint. And I think the vast majority of people uh, understand that that's uh, dedicated to that, uh, that source. One of the things on the burning here, we get to our next, uh, our, our next audience member. And by the way, I want to encourage, uh, recognize also in the audience here, we have uh, students from the Baltimore Freedom Academy in Baltimore uh, and city neighbors schools in Baltimore here. Uh, and we encourage them to participate and uh, have questions asked. If that's why you're here. To, you can get your thoughts heard as well. Um, and we're glad they're here. And we want to thank all the folks who actually sponsored those young people. Uh, we put a call out and people purchased tickets so that the students could participate today, and we appreciate that deeply. Um, 
one of the issues that you know is going to come here is going to cause probably the large amount of controversy of the, will be the Marriage Equality Act. The governor is going to come out for it, apparently, uh, that there will be provisions in it. And the bill that I think they want to put forth that uh, exempts religious institutions from uh, having to uh, participate uh, in, in same-sex marriages. So let's talk from your perspectives in your houses what's going to happen with that in, in both, your, uh, both your arenas. Well, it'll pass your house last year. <clears throat> Mike? Well, I think it'll pass the Senate again. And the vote was 25 to 22. Um, I, I it didn't have the religious exemptions. I would like to have the religious exemptions in the bill. Um, so I, I believe that um, Catholic Charities did great work with adoptions in Massachusetts. Uh, I'm very familiar with adoptions. And, um, and uh, they, they're out of business now. And uh, so I would like certain exceptions carved into the bill if, in fact, it's going to become a law. Now, Mick, can I ask another question, Mike, about that? Last year, at the end of our, <coughs> end of our uh, Annapolis Summit, you were pretty adamantly opposed to this. I mean, has, have you changed your idea no, about that? Not at all. I mean, I, you know, I, um, I don't want to sound like, a, you know, one of the Republican candidates for president. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I am what I am. I mean, uh, and I just, um, my mother and father were married for 50 years. So I've got... Uh, uh, five children. I've got uh, 13 grandchildren. I just uh, I'm a traditionalist, uh, but at the same time I'm also a Democrat. And in terms of a lot of the majority view prevail, uh, that uh, in a democracy, you know, that all voices be heard at all times, and um, and uh, it's it's a very close vote, and I committed to uh, uh, bring it to vote, and uh, the, when the votes were counted, I don't try to influence anybody's vote, and you, people shouldn't on this issue. It, uh, it was 25 uh, for uh, the bill and 22 against. I don't think anybody's views are going to be changed in the Senate, and I think the vote will be the same. It was your house, the shock people, because it voted it down. Well, uh, there, there are a few votes uh, uh, short, and people have strong feelings on it. To me, though, it's a civil rights issue. I mean, I think uh, when we first started the discussion, uh, we were talking about civil unions, and I think if you use the term civil unions, it, 85, 90 uh, members of the House vote for it. But the fact of the matter is pointed out to me is that uh, in the federal law, the term civil marriage is used and it denies about 200 benefits uh, to those who would get married under the terminology of, of civil union. So civil marriage became an equal rights issue under, under the law. And we're talking about uh, civil government, not uh, religious organizations. And it seems to me from a, a sense here uh, in Maryland that you know, they allow same-sex marriage in Washington, D.C. Uh, people from the state go there and get married. They come back. The attorney general has said they'll be treated just like any other married couple. So I haven't seen any negative effect that's taking place in Washington, D.C. or any negative effect that's taking place in Maryland uh, with people returning here to the community. But I think it's a consistency, and I think for the, the community uh, uh, that believe in uh, equality, that it is a civil rights issue. And I think it's you know, going to be the civil rights issue of the next 10 years. And I think this issue has emerged, and I think uh, you're going to see, whether it's this year or in the future, uh, same-sex marriage is, and equality is going to, going to be passed. And do you both see that this will end up being a huge state fight afterwards in terms of referendums around uh, yes. marriage equality and also around the Dream yeah. Act? I think if, if it passes, it'll be a petition and referendum, and I think it obviously will be on the ballot in November. Uh, if, if, in fact, it does pass this year. But I do think that it's a civil rights issue. I've been convinced that a civil rights issue. I mean, I came up in the 60s, went to college in Philadelphia when civil rights and equal rights were, were huge initiatives. And I see some of the same parallels that I saw in the 60s that I see in this issue. I don't Let's go see back. it's a civil rights issue. Honestly, I don't. I, you know, I'm a historian, and I look at civilizations. I study civilizations. I read history every night. And... Um, I see it's attack on the families. I think it's attack on traditional families, and uh, uh, that's where I see it. And uh, uh, I think if it goes to referendum, which I'm certain it will if it passes, I think it's defeated. I think coming together evangelicals, Catholics, African Americans uh, are going to come together, and I think it's going to go to the polls. I think it's going to be defeated. I think it'll be a close vote. Uh, Maryland is a middle state of a middle temperament, and we're very evenly divided on this issue, just like we're evenly divided on the Dream Act. Uh, but I think if it goes to polls, uh, the, the, the other side is more motivated. And I think they'll get their voters out, and I think it gets, goes down to defeat. I think that uh, 
part of this debate shows you know how passionate people are on both sides of this. I mean, uh, there are a lot of people that you know they they have a strong feeling that uh, that they don't want to see the traditional marriage change. Other people feel that it's a, a civil rights issue, and it, and uh, I like the president of the Senate. I, I try to get everybody as much factual information as I can and let them make their own decisions. So. Uh, if it passes this year, uh, even with the influence of the governor, I think uh, you know you will have to convince about ten people that last year wanted more information uh, on the on the initiative why they vote for civil marriage rather than civil unions, and I think that's what it comes down to. Let's return to our audience. Go ahead, sir. Good morning. Uh, I'm Gary Brennan from Frederick County. Um, <clears throat> also here today with MSEA. Um, First, I, I thank you for your comments on maintenance of effort. I think the fix there is really important. But I am concerned that a, a push of the cost of pensions could undo the good you do on uh, MO, fixing MOE, particularly when you talk about what will give the county some authority to raise revenue. And, and I and many people in more rural Maryland are from counties that you can give them that authority. That doesn't mean they're going to do that because right. they're automatically opposed to any kind of revenue increase. So how would you actually assure that they still are uh, not cutting into the classroom to fund that pension shift. Well, you know, again, I'm, my goal in life is to improve education. I'm the oldest of 10 kids, all went to public schools, went to land-grant colleges. And um, if, if I've had any input, input in my years, now, it's been on education. Uh, the bill that I put forth three years ago required maintenance of effort at that time. It required maintenance of effort and had a gradual shift of the pension. So therefore, I mean, it would save Montgomery County education $200 million this year. Montgomery County said, we can't pass, we can't pass. They cost them $200 million by not passing that bill this year. Overall, it's going to cost Montgomery County educators $324 million by not going with maintenance of effort three years ago. Uh, so we're going to try to find a way to fashion something that benefits all, but particularly education. Now, at the present time, the superintendents of the schools, the boards of education, the teachers are all on board in terms of maintenance of effort. Uh, hopefully, we can make something positive happen so that all educational systems in all counties benefit. But it's hard when you have little Talbot County who has very little tax effort, one of the wealthiest counties, very little tax effort, telling the Board of Education, the state superintendent schools to go to hell. There is no such thing as maintenance of effort. We're not gonna, we're not gonna abide by the law, we don't think there is such a law, and we're not gonna do it. And yet their, their children continue to underachieve. You know, we need to find some way to bring them to the table. Let me just say this, that uh, I'm a strong believer in maintenance effort because school boards don't have the ability to raise revenue and counties have to. And you not only you're seeing uh, the issues uh, of not, not fully funding education, they're cost shifting some things that the counties used to pick up, like debt costs for school construction, they're passing that on to uh, school boards to pick up. Uh, so I think there needs to be a real clarification in the law uh, of, of what we're trying to accomplish. When I say to legislators, look, you raised a penny on the sales tax and you made the investment in K-12 education, if they're not making the same effort on the local level, uh, then they're, you're wasting uh, what you've done in, as far as uh, a revenue authority, and you have to make sure that your local government is, is complying. I think everybody takes, I mean, every legislator here takes uh, pride in their local school system. I know I do. And uh, I think that uh, you can see some things coming out of some of these counties uh, that have been harmful uh, to education. And, and vast majority, I would say, have done a very good job but there are some that have been harmful. But the same token, I mean, their income tax comes through the state. They don't meet maintenance effort. I mean, the state has the ability to withhold some of their piggyback tax. I'm Constance Green. This is Sabrina Dominic. We're representing City Neighbors High School. Um, at City Neighbors, because we're a charter school, we've had the opportunity to have renovations in our building and make our school more safe and beautiful. We've also managed to change our relationship with the community. And I guess our question is, will you help support us in making sure that other schools in Baltimore City safe and beautiful? What was the last sentence? The schools in Baltimore City what? Safe and beautiful. <coughs> Stay what? Safe. Safe, safe and beautiful. Safe? Safe and beautiful. The charter schools or the public schools? They're both. What, okay. All schools? All. all. Absolutely. Absolutely. Baltimore City is has made great strides under its school superintendent and uh, working very hard. The governor's monitored this very closely. He monitors test scores. He monitors lowering classroom size. He's very concerned about teacher salaries. And now we're trying to get money to improve the, uh, 
the physical structure. The physical plants are very old. They're not building new schools in Baltimore City. What we need to do is improve the physical plants. And uh, absolutely true. Governor Ehrlich, one of his signature items was uh, passing charter schools. Uh, we, I voted for it, we supported it, and we congratulate you on the charter school you're attending. Yeah, I think that uh, you know, charter schools, uh, each superintendent has the ability to institute what he wants. I think uh, Superintendent Alonzo has done a good job in Baltimore City. He's made numerous uh, smaller high schools. You still have your traditional city in Poly, but there's 37 high schools now in Baltimore City. Uh, right. Many of them have 300 uh, students or less. Many of them are charter schools. Uh, but it's, but it, uh, it's an effort uh, on, at the local level, obviously, to give kids a more engaged uh, curriculum as well as making them safer environments uh, to go to school in. Good morning. My name is Michelle Merkel, and I'm here on behalf of Food and Water Watch today. And I have a two-part question about hydraulic fracturing, which, as you know, is a process for extracting natural gas from deep hard rock formations. And we know from the experience of states like Pennsylvania, <coughs> who've had sort of a love affair with fracking since 2007, that jobs haven't been brought to rural communities as promised by the industry, that there have been a decline in property values, and now EPA is investigating cases of contaminated drinking water in Pennsylvania and other states. And I appreciate that the governor put a commission in place in Maryland to um, look at the practice of fracking. But unlike states like New York, there's no ban on the practice during the penancy of the study. So my first question is, would you support such a ban, at least during the um, penancy of the commission's evaluation? And my second question is that there's likely to be legislation this year that would ban um, Maryland from receiving fracking wastewater from other states and likewise ban wastewater treatment plants from treating that way. So is that legislation that you would support as well? And if not, why? I don't think it's going to pass, quite frankly. I think our governor was very wise in what he did, unlike New York and Pennsylvania, who jumped into the fray, said this is a great source, we need to move forward immediately. He said, look, let's study it. The study's going to take four years. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're working it, we're looking at it, we're making very carefully, and we're going to make, hopefully make wise decisions when the study uh, is, is through. Uh, and also you have issues of private property rights involved, uh, such as people signing leases and things of that nature uh, in Western Maryland. That has to be looked at by this administration, but in terms of a total ban right now, I, I, I personally don't think the General Assembly is uh, going to move forward in that area. I, I, I need more information. I thought it was totally banned until the end of the study, so uh, <coughs> uh, we'll have to have more information on that. Uh, but I think uh, the governor has made well, a lot of decisions. Well, nothing's happening. I mean, nothing, nothing, no, none of this is taking place right now. But I mean, people are signing up leases and things of that nature. But my impression from the executive order and other documents that it is not the practice is not banned during the pendency of this study. And so I'm asking that some certain states yeah. like New York, who yeah. also undertake yeah, well, it would have to be approved by the state, though. And I don't know why the governor would give one of his agencies the ability to uh, approve this when he had a, had a study going on. Yeah, I'll certainly ask that question of the governor. But what about right. the second question about the uh, banning toxic wastewater from coming into the state of Maryland from other states and being treated? I, I'm, I think it's a law now. Uh, I, yeah, I'm not that familiar with it, but I, I certainly don't think, uh, you know, we should have toxic water coming in from other states. I quite candidly would like to uh, get the state of Pennsylvania <coughs> to do something with Susquehanna so every time we have a storm we wouldn't pollute the Chesapeake Bay. But uh, uh, so, but I would, I would, I would support that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We'll take that up in the coming months and take a look where that is. Uh, let me, I have to ask a question before, we, um, before I forget, and it, it's a very touchy question, uh, Mike Miller, about Ulysses Curry. Some people have called for the Senate to expel him. Um, do you think that should happen? Do you think that conversation is going to take place? And uh, what about tightening up the ethics laws <laughs> uh, for, the, for the GA in well, general? First, first of all, we're going to tighten up the ethics law. We've you know, uh, we have a constitutional lawyer, uh, Jamie Raskin from Montgomery County, yeah. looking at our ethics laws. We created a commission where he's going to make recommendations to the General Assembly and have them in place uh, by March 1st so we can en enact them. Uh, we're going to put uh, these so-called disclosure laws online, uh, tighten them up. You know, just last year, we, we passed them for everybody. We, we, ethics disclosure, I mean, there was much wailing, gnashing of teeth, these county commissioners, school board members. Now, they all have to comply with our ethics laws, and we passed that last year. Now we're putting everything online. We're going to make judges comply. Judges right now say, no change, no change, no change. Well, guess what, judges? You're like everybody else. You know, you might have robitis, but you're going to have to comply with the law, you know, and, um, and, and make them apply to everybody and put them online so that everybody knows something about everybody else. And uh, at the same time, uh, Senator Curry's uh, 
hearing uh, will be referred to a joint committee, joint House and Senate committee. And uh, neither the speaker or I sit on that committee, but uh, we have competent chairmen who will conduct the hearing. Uh, we'll have uh, an advocate on behalf of the state, someone from the Assistant Attorney General's Office, Assistant Attorney General's Office, and he'll have a lawyer. And um, uh, there's certainly consequences to his action. He's already lost his position as chairman of uh, an important standing committee. And then what actions that the, the committee recommends will certainly be up to the, what they recommend. But um, it'll be, um, they'll, they're going to meet the first week of the session. And hopefully we can have this matter resolved um, expeditiously within the first three or four weeks. Good morning. My name morning. is Destiny Green. I am a Baltimore um, City student and president of Baltimore Freedom Academy Student Council. Um, there was a comment made earlier about you put education first, but it seemed like we're facing lots of cuts. How are you? How are you going to put education first when you're making a lot of cuts on education yeah, funding? I'd I, I, I like to say that uh, I think the state's made its full commitment to K-12 education, uh, and you know there's local money that goes into uh, schools as well, but you know, from where uh, we sit, uh, you know, we fully funded uh, our obligation to Thornton. As I said, we put in 48% of the total uh, cost K through 12 education at the state level. Uh, at the local level, uh, I'm not exactly sure what contribution Baltimore City makes. Uh, but in essence, I mean, in the way that we fund education here, uh, K through 12, Baltimore is one of the poor, poorer subdivisions. They get about 75% of their money from the state and only have to put up about 25. Baltimore City's so. contribution hasn't changed over 10 years. Yeah. Over 10 years. The money that you see in Baltimore City, the increases comes from the state. Uh, Baltimore City doesn't have the resources that other subdivisions do, but we're try, we try very hard to uh, make certain that there are not cuts to education in Baltimore City. Uh, have, uh, you have to vote pretty soon on the new legislative map. <coughs> redistricting right okay. okay we should and could we're gonna have hearings that has we you know we, we, the governor has got to introduce it as a bill we'll have hearings and if we can move forward we will and if we can't what, what the governor's proposed becomes law in 45 days but we're going to try uh, it's very difficult because everyone uh, has something that they don't like about the map and everyone wants to change it you have 141 members of the house and 47 members of the senate and when you change one precinct, it's a domino effect across the entire state. It's a very difficult process. And growing populations that feel underrepresented in the state. Excuse me? And growing populations that feel underrepresented in the state. Well, that's not true because it's one person, one vote. They're no, not we, underrepresented. Look, you ha you, you've had uh, 12 public hearings in the interim. Uh, you had a commission that's made a recommendation to the governor. Uh, once that was made, there was a public hearing once again on that map. And people had the ability to go to the governor until he puts the map in uh, on opening day, which is today. Uh, so there's been a tremendous amount of input uh, to try to meet uh, the vast majority of concerns that are out there. And obviously, there's a lot of people who have a lot of different uh, opinions. As the President of the Senate said, I mean, once you move one thing, it has <coughs> an effect on, on another area. The fact of the matter is the Washington suburbs have grown, the Baltimore suburbs have decreased. Uh, we tried to uh, honor uh, county lines. I mean, the courts drew up a map that wanted to limit the number of crossovers. They had 14. We have 13. We increased the number of minority districts in the state of Maryland from 10 to 12. Uh, for the first time ever, there will be a minority district in uh, Prince George's County and a single member delegate district for a Hispanic community, which represents 65% of the district. So you try to meet the national guidelines as well as uh, what the uh, the court system has has directed the state, and uh, ultimately, uh, if it becomes law, the remedy for many people is they go to court like they did before. Um, so, so I want to thank both of you. This is you, you do this every year. We appreciate you taking the time for the citizens of the state for this Annapolis yeah. summit being a legislative session. Uh, Senate President Mike Miller, Speaker of the House Michael Bush. It's good thank to you. have you both with us. And, well, thank you. and we're going to take a very brief break. I want to thank the Baltimore Business Journal, Stevenson University, Maryland State Education Association, Maryland Department of Housing and Community Development, CS CSX, and of course WEA, the Marble Public Radio, and the Mayor's Channel for uh, helping us get this going today. We're going to take a very brief break and come back with the Governor.